Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. Welcome to this third webinar in a series of the EU-Russia exchange on sustainable building policies and measures. This is in, done in the context of the strategic partnership for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And the purpose of this webinar series is to exchange learnings to exchange experiences on policies to promote a sustainable buildings and construction sector. Today is the third webinar. It is the final webinar in this series, but there will be a closing event, which we will talk about at the very end of this webinar. My name is Oliver Rapf. I am the executive director of BPAE. And BPAE is together with ABOC organizing this series of events. Now, before we come into the detailed agenda, I would just like to give everybody some technical instructions. Because we are offering, first of all, we are offering a simultaneous translation service. And you can choose whether you want to listen to this webinar in the original language. That means you then have to choose the floor, but then the presentations will alter between English and Russian. Or whether you want to listen to it permanently in Russian language or in English language. So we will have simultaneous translation throughout the webinar and you can make your choice. You see it there on the slide. The choice where you can select that is the audio channel selector on the upper left hand corner of your screen and hopefully that is all going to work really well for you. Um, the webinar is also going to be recorded or the recording is already live. Uh, we will make the recording available to all the participants. It will be available on ABOX website. It will also be available on BPAE's website. And if you haven't had the opportunity to listen into the earlier webinars, um, they are already available on the various websites. In case you're not speaking, in case you're just a participant, I would like to invite you to always keep your microphone off and to keep your camera off, simply um, to avoid any background noise and to reduce the bandwidth of the transmission so you don't have to have your camera on uh, when you are not speaking. This is really just to introduce the technical side of this webinar. I think we can now move right into the context. And the purpose of this webinar is really to create and increase the exchange between Russia and the European Union about sustainable building policies to fertilize learning, to spur transfer and implementation of good practices to decarbonize the building stock in a socially fair manner and to scale up sustainable innovation in the sector across the countries. As I mentioned earlier, um, we will have a number of presentations, but there will also be an opportunity for you to ask questions. And for that purpose, we will we have a chat box. Um, you will find the chat button in the top right hand corner of your screen. So you simply click on that chat button. You type in your question. It can be in Russian or it can be in English. Uh, don't worry about the language. We have the translation facilities on site. So please feel free to send in your questions and we will then try to answer them as much as possible. I cannot promise that we will be able to answer each and every question simply because of time constraints, but we will certainly do our best. And we have a number of panel discussions, two to be exact. Um, we first have uh, a number of presentations, as you can see now here on the screen. I will introduce them one by one. We have a panel discussion. We will then actually have a very short break, just of about 10 minutes. And then we will move into the second session, which will again have an opportunity for you to engage and ask questions. And with that, I would like to close my short introduction and invite 
my colleague, Professor Mariana Brodak from our partner, ABOC, to say a few welcoming words and to give the perspective from your side. Thank you very much, Mariana, for organizing this webinar series with us. It's been a, a great experience so far, and I'm sure this webinar today will also be a very interesting event. Mariana, over to you. Thank you so much, Oliver. I would like to express my gratitude to, to you personally and your company, BBIE, which is the leading and independent expert uh, center for energy efficiency of buildings. We would like to thank you for inviting us all together to uh, lead this series of webinars and uh, uh, this exchange between EU and Russia uh, on the policy and measures uh, uh, in terms of sustainable building or, or construction. So now we have got uh, a few uh, webinars available uh, on our website and today's uh, webinar will also be uh, uploaded there and you, you will have a web uh, link to it. This series of webinars uh, is uh, conducted on two platforms, Interactio and Avoc. Uh, what about the languages you can listen to this webinar? Uh, you, uh, on our platform, we have uh, uh, only Russian, uh, so you don't have to switch anything. It is just for Russian-speaking audience. For those who are in... Uh, uh, on the internet interactive platform, you can choose uh, either English, Russian, or uh, floor where you can hear both Russian and English. It's excellent that we can have such uh, events with simultaneous interpretation and we can hear our presentations uh, uh, on uh, any language. And these reports uh, are very interesting and they enable us to deeply learn about each other's experience, uh, others' experiences, uh, learn more what happens in Europe uh, in more detail, uh, look at uh, Russia, what we can see in Russia, what uh, prospects do we have here. And uh, as for our today's participants, uh, today uh, for registration of this webinar, uh, it was arranged on a book uh, platform and uh, BPIE platform as well. And uh, uh, for today's uh, uh, morning, we have more than 210 participants only uh, on a book. It is uh, uh, 182 and uh, 144 of them from 38 cities of Russian Federation of the Russian Federation. And uh, 70 specialists uh, from 30 countries uh, outside of the Russian Federation. And I have Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Latvia, Moldova, Ukraine, Estonia, Germany, England. And uh, I, I think we also have registration uh, uh, BPIE. Uh, So I consider that uh, our audience is very broad and uh, we have already mentioned that uh, on our ebook uh, website there are 185 specialists online right now so all the rest are uh, expected. So thank you one more time Oliver for this opportunity uh, to be your co-moderator and for this opportunity to lead this uh, webinar and uh, over to you again. and for sharing these impressive figures with us. I'm great that we have such a large audience. And I would just like to invite the audience again to make sure that your uh, microphone is off when you are not speaking. So we're now going to go right into the topic. This series of webinars is actually funded by the German Environment Ministry 
and the European Union's partnership instrument for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And though, of course, and, and therefore, of course, we want to know what the European Union is doing on the topic of reducing the carbon emissions across the whole life cycle across the whole lifetime of buildings and the eu has already undertaken a number of steps in march 2020 the european commission announced a so-called circular economy action plan which is also placing importance on advancing the circularity in the construction sector it does not only cover the construction sector but the construction sector is playing a very very important role because the construction sector alone is responsible for around about 35 percent of the eu's total waste generation and this circular economy action plan announces a number of initiatives which will come from the European Union. For example, the so-called construction product regulation will be revised. The European Union intends to develop a digital logbook for buildings. It wants to integrate the life cycle assessment in public procurement and in the European Union's sustainable finance framework. And it wants to make sure that the European renovation wave also reduces the lifetime carbon impact of buildings and in all these documents the instrument of levels is a key reference and our first speaker josefina lindbone will cover and go into details what levels actually is what its history is and what its goals are josefina thank you very much for joining us this morning you are with DG Environment at the European Commission, and you are working there in the unit of sustainable production, products and cons consumptions, and you have been responsible for the topic of sustainable buildings already since 2011. And I know you personally have been one of the key driving forces behind the development and implementation of levels. Josefina, thank you very much for joining us this morning. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation and the floor is now yours for the next 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Very happy to be here. It is a, it is an interesting uh, opportunity for, for us as well. Uh, I, I understand that you will be handling my presentation from your side. Yes, we can certainly do that. Just tell us when to move to the next slide, please. Yes, because the slide I'm seeing is not my slide. So I'm, yeah, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, so indeed, uh, thank you, Oliver, for the, for the introduction and the very well uh, explanation of where this sits in the policy landscape. Uh, Oliver mentioned a number of policy initiatives uh, where the European Commission is, is driving sustainable buildings and where levels plays a role. And actually the, uh, the, uh, the document, uh, the communication, as we call them, uh, that Oliver was referring to was something that came out uh, more than one year and a half ago. And since then, we have been busy and we have indeed been implementing many of the things that, that you listed there. But the work goes on. But here I am today more to talk about levels per se. So if I could please have the next slide. So why, why life cycle? thinking and here I need, I think, to, to put on my own glasses. Um, we know that if we look at the full life cycle of a building, uh, this sector is responsible for half of our extracted materials, half of our total energy consumption, uh, a third of our water consumption and a third of all waste generated. So this is if we are looking at the full life cycle and go beyond the pure use phase of the building. Uh, so when I talk about the energy here, for example, I am also including the energy that is needed to, uh, uh, to extract the materials, to produce the construction material, etc. So levels is then a, a methodology uh, which makes it possible to assess and report on the sustainability over the full life cycle. We started this work back in 2015. 
because before that we had concluded that we wanted to be able in the European Union to drive uh, and, and incentivize uh, through policy different kinds of sustainability aspects of buildings. But there was no clear um, understanding or agreement or, of what that actually meant beyond energy efficiency. We just knew that we had to include many more things. Hence the work on levels. And we have been doing that for the last five, six years, uh, based uh, on a, a large collaborative or through a collaborative process with a large number of different kinds of building professionals and member states representatives, of course. And Levels was published one year ago. And now we are busy including it in policy, I was just saying. Uh, please, next slide. So Levels is a common language. That's how we see it. As I said, we started to develop it back in 2015. Uh, we have been developing this tool uh, uh, focusing on both new buildings and renovation projects. Uh, and we have focused on residential buildings and offices. It doesn't mean that it can't be used for other buildings, such as, for example, schools. Uh, but uh, we had those two large typologies of buildings or kinds of buildings in mind. Now, Levels uh, is a very detailed methodology, which I said has been developed together with the sector and member states. It is based on best practice industry standards and it sets forward a number of core indicators which have been very thoroughly tested also by the sector. So when I say that we have been working on it since 2015 and published it last year then, that also includes a thorough testing phase. Uh, we wanted, uh, the, the idea from the beginning was that we wanted to provide um, this common language, a tool which can be used for the mainstream market. So even if you're not intending to certify your building, because there are many good certification schemes out there, of course, uh, we wanted to provide a tool for all those projects um, which are interested in, in understanding uh, how their different decisions along a building process actually impact the sustainability performance of the building throughout the, taking the life cycle concept uh, uh, into account. Um, so that was the intention to bring in the user or take the, the user on a journey to gradually learn more and more of, of, of how different things can be done uh, to improve the, the performance of the building. Meanwhile, we also see how certification schemes are very interested in levels. Uh, many of them, of the bigger ones, also took part in the development and testing of levels. And we now see how they are aligning themselves to a large extent to the levels indicators. So it means that levels are sort of working on, on different levels, I was about to say, but uh, uh, it targets, it has an impact on certification, but levels is so much more. We want it to be used as an inspiration and as a guidance also for those projects which are not certified. So uh, please, the next slide. So first of all, just a snapshot, what areas are we talking about here? So levels covers, uh, first of all, uh, the use of resources such as energy, material and water. And they, of course, when you use resources, that has an impact on the, on the environment. But we are also looking at aspects which are linked to health and comfort and life cycle cost, value and risk. So if I could have the next one, please. So here are actually the six macro objectives, which we defined in those three areas I just showed. We decided those six macro objectives after one year of, of uh, discussions and, uh, and, and sort of uh, screening of what would be useful. We, what we did was that we looked at what are the main areas um, in, uh, that the building have an impact on in one way or the other and where the EU believes it should have policy. So in that overlap, we, we concluded on those six macro objectives. So it is whole life carbon. So that is, of course, linked to the use of the energy throughout the full life cycle. 
It is resource efficient material flows, so the materials that we are using, and efficient use of water. And then we have, as I mentioned, also um, a macro objective, which is uh, health and comfort. And we have the adaptation and resilience to climate change, increasingly important, and the life cycle cost and value. So these are six macro objectives. In these six macro objectives, we have our indicators. So if I could have the next slide, please. Here you see the, the, the indicators to the right linked to all those macro objectives. I, I will not go through them in detail, but I wanted to include them here in the presentation so that uh, I hope you have the chance maybe to, to go back to them and look later on. But you will see that for each macro objective, there is at least one indicator. Normally, there are more. And with those, we try to cover the most important aspects of a building. Now, of course, there are very many things which are important to buildings. You could easily end up with very many indicators. But it has been a real challenge to try to reduce these as much as possible, but still being able to capture the most important aspects. But we wanted to bring something, as I said, to the mainstream market, which which can take the user on, on a journey and not flood uh, flood the user with, with too many indicators from, from the outset. Um, so so these are the these are the indicators. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So these indicators can be used actually at three different levels. So you can start using the indicator uh, at level one, where you use it at the concept stage already, where you use the indicator in a qualitative way. So then it will typically be used uh, to help the, the design team to have a conversation with the client and, and focus that conversation on what will be the main uh, objectives of the, the, mo the most important aspects of the, of the project. And then you can go on and use the indicator at level two. That is at the design and the construction stage. And then you will use the same indicator then at a, in a quantitative way. And at level three, that is really at the handover uh, when the building is ready. Uh, and in some cases also, you can use the indicator to monitor the performance of the building uh, in post-occupancy. Uh, and uh, and it is then also the opportunity to, to check if the building actually performs the way it was intended. Um, now, you don't have to use all the three levels. Uh, you don't have to use, if you start to use it in level one, you don't have to use it in, at level two. Uh, you maybe only want to use it at level two and not in level one for, for whatever reason. So it's really, it's up to you. Levels is, is a voluntary tool even though we're starting, of course, to use it also in, in policy. But the, the, whole, um, the whole scope of indicators is still voluntary. You choose the indicators that you want to work with and in the levels you want to, to, to work with them on. And it's not because you choose to work with one indicator at one particular level that you have to do the same for all the other indicators. It's free. Next, please. So we are already seeing how levels is influencing policy. Uh, we see how it is doing so when it comes to carbon performance. Uh, we have uh, an energy performance of buildings directive, which is being revised, and it starts now to introduce elements of whole life carbon in it. And we will also be developing a roadmap for the reduction of whole life carbon, uh, where we will be basing ourselves on one of the indicators in levels. Uh, Oliver mentioned sustainable finance, which is about uh, uh, how to steer private investment and there we have already uh, one so-called delegated act uh, out, uh, which has been adopted, uh, where we are regarding climate. And there we have already included the indicator from levels on whole life carbon for new big buildings. Uh, we are now having a, developed a second delegated act under this very interesting initiative, which is more focusing on circularity. And again, levels and the indicators will play an important role for buildings. When it comes to public procurement, we have already included uh, the recommendation to use whole life carbon and the levels indicator in the energy efficiency directive. And we are also working on a new complete set of green public procurement criteria, which will be thoroughly based on levels. So levels is really the basis on which to bring circularity and life cycle thinking into building policy. Next one, please. Yes, very briefly, implementing the so-called uh, recovery and resilience plans, 
which is um, uh, an outcome of how to, to take uh, the EU um, out of the corona crisis, uh, which, which will to a large extent also be based on, on supporting, for example, renovation of buildings. And levels will also play an important role there to take the full life cycle into account. So please, the next one. We also see how different national legislations, uh, regional legislations and certifications are, are basing themselves on levels now. Here I've just put uh, very few examples, but there are many more. But just to show that it is not just at the EU level uh, where we are using levels now as a, as a basis for bringing in life cycle thinking into policy, but that this is also happening in different kinds of, uh, of levels in the EU. Next one, please. Yes, I mentioned before that uh, we will develop a roadmap for the reduction of whole life carbon up to 2050. And this is sort of a, a side of, of levels, I should say, but it is really the development of one of the levels indicators, which helps us in doing this. Uh, we believe it is very important to have this roadmap to further uh, sort of guide uh, future policy in, in, in carbon which, which are there to, to help us to reach carbon neutrality for the future. Thank you. And the next one, I believe, is my... Ah, yeah, of course, the key benefits for levels, uh, the way we see it, but also certainly the way we've understood that uh, many of those who have helped us to develop and test levels, I think of it, is that it is a common language using best practice industry standards. Um, it tracks performance throughout the full life cycle and it brings accountability and investor confidence in the way that it follows a project throughout the full life cycle and also looks at the real performance in the end. It enhances dialogue between stakeholders and it supports sustainability skills and understanding. We hear this from, from projects working with levels that it really raises their understanding and awareness um, in, in this area. And as I've tried to show you, it underpins also future policy. Uh, and for sure, uh, especially when it comes to carbon neutrality, we believe that a tool like this and an indicator like, like the whole life carbon one is necessary for, for future proofing our buildings. So levels is uh, for you uh, if you're working in design and execution, in planning and policy or in financing. Uh, we have involved all these kinds of professionals in the development of levels. Next, yeah. So with that, I want to thank you. And I, uh, rec oh, I encourage you to, to visit our website or join our Levels LinkedIn group, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josefina, for this great overview, for setting the scene, what the EU is currently doing and what it's planning to do to reduce the whole life carbon impact of the built environment. And I hand over to my colleague Mariana to introduce session number one and the first speaker in that session. Thank you. I would also like to um, thank you, Josephine. I would also like to invite her if uh, she wishes to send her article to our journal of AVOC, a journal of decarbonization. Uh, we will be uh, delighted if you send us um, our, if you send us your article. Uh, we are about three minutes late and now we're going to the next, and uh, to the next presenter. And we are now, will be, uh, talking about reducing carbon emissions during the um, life uh, cycle of buildings. I would like to invite Ksenia Agapova, who is an international expert in the field of sustainability. She has certification experience of more than 80 buildings in Russia and abroad. She, um, she has also been the recipient of an award for her projects in Singapore and Azerbaijan. Um, her presentation is entitled A Tool for Urban Regeneration, Renovation Cases and LCA Approach. Ksenia, over to you, please.
Thank you very much. I would like to thank you for inviting me to this seminar because uh, this uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be invited uh, in terms of my professional work. I have to say uh, that it's not it's not very often that I get an opportunity to talk at a high level about those specialized um, topics, considering lowering of carbon emissions in the uh, built environment. So thank you so much. Yes, I do uh, work in Russia in the field of certification. Uh, this uh, industry is developing very actively in Russia. We are certifying a lot of projects in Russia and abroad. We see this market developing and changing the culture of uh, the construction industry, uh, changing the uh, concept of um, uh, carbon footprint. So uh, I would like to set a little bit of context. Um, of course, we all understand what is happening now on our planet. The planet's resources are being depleted. Uh, we are living now in in debt to the future generations. And uh, there are now certain conversations being held on the Russian markets uh, regarding uh, climate change, because climate change is materializing and has an impact on our lives. We can see it right now. We can also see that impact on our buildings, on the resources that we're using. So if we're talking about urban domain and uh, reducing the carbon footprint in urban environment, we can see two um, sources of reducing that carbon footprint. So first of all, it's uh, detached buildings, individual buildings. And secondly, uh, second but not least, is of course infrastructure. Over the course of my um, of, of my professional work, of course, I'm focused on individual buildings, on uh, increasing their resource efficiency and reducing carbon footprint of uh, separate individual buildings. So, uh, what what, what uh, would I like to share with you in terms of my personal experience? We uh, often carry out uh, the so-called energy modeling. What is this? This uh, energy modeling is a, a test drive of the building using virtual environment, using uh, uh, computer software. So uh, uh, we design the architecture, the engineering moments, the systems at this stage. So we carry out a simulation over 365 days of the year. And whilst we, are, we carry out this simulation, this modeling, we are able to model various um, architectural nuances, various architectural systems. This energy modeling provides us with a perfect tool for understanding the future building and allows us to test our the energy efficiency measures that we are planning to use in the future. So uh, why am I talking about energy modeling? Simply because using this uh, modeling, we have been able to understand what measures are the most efficient in terms of resources, in terms of um, use of capital, we came to a conclusion that energy efficiency is based on reducing of use, then optimizing the use, and then replacing certain uh, sources of energy by alternative sources of energy. 
So reducing, in terms of reducing, we uh, talk about using maybe passive, certain passive measures that are to do with the design of the building. So optimizing the space, um, maybe reducing uh, the uh, space of a certain parts of the building, that, that in itself allows us to uh, reduce the energy use in the future. Optimization means uh, using, using uh, more energy um, efficient engineering equipment and placing it in a certain way. So if we, we were to talk about lighting, so a uh, reduction stage uh, of lighting, lighting is when we're using more natural space, not natural light. And optimizing is when we're using certain um, effective sensors, for example, sensors of lighting, uh, motion sensors, and uh, replacement stage is when we uh, replace, for example, uh, existing elements with solar panels, for example. Therefore, efficiency of these measures increases in a, in a pyramid way. So the most efficient measures are the so-called passive measures. There are measures that um, are, we are able to include in the design wh whilst, it's still, whilst we're still working on it on the paper. The measures that we can test on the first stage of modeling. And of course, selecting the right equi uh, equipment and uh, the very last uh, stage would be alternative sources. So talking about energy efficiency of individual buildings, based on our experience, we can say the following. The measures in, in terms of uh, reducing the um, carbon footprint and uh, the measures in terms of uh, replacing, uh, replacing alternative sources, all of those measures are dictated by the urban environment. For example, if, um, um, if we have um, a certain uh, problem on a construction site, or perhaps uh, we, we might not be able to use a lot of natural light because of uh, the position of the building. And the same goes for alternative energy sources. So when we are designing a buildings for urban use, very often our options are limited in terms of um, use of alternative sources, because we are limited by the use of urban environment. So talking about passive strategies of design that are uh, that that have uh, the largest impact on uh, the um, energy efficiency of the building during its life cycle, I would like to say um, that the most efficient measures are designing of the building facade. Uh, attempts to limit uh, the number of um, windows in a certain parts of the facade. Also natural vent ventilation, use of green roof. These passive measures, these passive measures very often can be designed at the first stage and can be designed um, during the urban planning as well. So of, of course, because we are building buildings not in the empty field, but as a part of the urban system. Therefore, uh, for example, we found this uh, toolkit for Vancouver. Uh, it is called Passive Design Toolkit. There, uh, we found a very interesting recommendation in terms of passive design of buildings for urban environment. We can influence those uh, things when we design large projects. Um, for example, we, we have uh, those projects going on now in Moscow. 
So uh, indeed, using those measures, we we can make some impact in terms of re uh, reduction of carbon footprint. So if we were to talk about uh, BREEAM communities, family of standards, I will not spend too much time talking about these standards in details. Uh, but I would like to say that it's um, about uh, large projects in urban environment. Uh, this methodology allows us to focus to focus on the design stage, uh, to focus on uh, important moments, important elements, and to be recognized for the use of these measures. Uh, currently, we don't have the, uh, such uh, projects in um, Russia, but uh, we uh, uh, use uh, certain approaches uh, according to BREAM uh, standards. So we use uh, the methodology uh, for life cycle assessment uh, for buildings uh, since uh, 2013. We've got such uh, uh, part of our design process which uh, goes uh, according to Brian approach. Uh, and uh, we first of all consider life cycle assessment. So uh, we do that uh, uh, using certain tools which uh, had been developed. Um, and uh, uh, in particular, Optima Plus uh, has uh, such uh, tools and the database regarding the uh, carbon footprint uh, for buildings. Uh, so we uh, calculate the footprint uh, of any building uh, during the life cycle according to the details of the construction uh, design project. And uh, along with this, we, uh, yeah, first of all, we would like to introduce uh, these uh, approaches. And uh, what we can see here that the major part of the uh, LCA, uh, we, we can choose correct materials and uh, we always uh, have to consider what will be the life uh, span of the building, how much will it cost, uh, its uh, uh, characteristics regarding uh, operation cycle. And we also assess the LSI uh, I'll say uh, on the basis of the environmental approach because uh, developers uh, maybe not every time consider this and uh, certain criteria uh, if they are not well thought of uh, in advance uh, in relation to uh, operation uh, stage of course uh, we can make a uh, number of mistakes uh, during the design stage. Another approach is the calculation of uh, uh, wastes uh, at different stages of the life uh, cycle of the building and uh, demolition uh, at the end of the day. And uh, we can uh, calculate uh, all the costs uh, and uh, the Pretty high costs uh, are uh, related to demolition uh, stage. Uh, I would be very glad to tell you more about different uh, strategies of the, the design, which many of our developers implement, but we are limited in time. So uh, that's why I will be glad to uh, tell you about these topics uh, in the framework of our further discussion. Thank you so much, Xin. It was a very interesting report. The, the, there are uh, even uh, questions uh, here already for you. And uh, our today's webinar is built in such a way that we uh, are going to listen to more reports. Uh, and after that, we uh, give the floor uh, for questions and answers. Now we would like to give the floor to Pablo van den Bosch and uh, I would, uh, yes, Oliver, please introduce Pablo. Uh, would be so kind, please. 
very much, Mariana. And yes, we will certainly cover the questions after Pablo's uh, presentation. We're now moving back to Europe after hearing about these interesting examples from Xenia Agapova, thank you very much also from my side for your presentation. Um, Pablo van den Bosch, our next speaker, is the co-founder of Modasta and a board member of Modasta Services. Now, Modasta stands um, for a very specific material passport and online registry for buildings, materials and buildings products because the idea behind Modesta is that there is essentially no waste in the construction sector. Everything can be a building material, but I think I will rather let Pablo explain the details of the initiative and the background behind it. Pablo, thank you very much for joining us today. I will hand over the virtual microphone now to you for the next 10 minutes and your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great introduction. And indeed, um, I'm from uh, Madastar and we are the register for products and materials in the built environment. Um, we started Madastar in 2017 and we are driven by a vision, a vision where we want to facilitate a circular economy. And that vision is not that complex. It's based on the four pictures that are on this slide. Um, first statement there is that our planet is a closed system. So everything we have on this planet, that's what we got to do with it. That means that all the resources are limited editions, like pieces of art. So why have we created an economy, a linear economy, where we take, make and waste? where we see waste as material without an identity. So let's eliminate waste and give materials an identity with the concept that we all understand, passports. Um, Pablo, yes. a quick, a quick uh, question or quick request, please, from my side. We cannot see your slides fully. Could you please go into the presentation mode so that they are bigger on the screen? Otherwise, they're too small. Ooh, I am on the presentation mode. That is a bit strange. I'll do it again. Are they on presentation mode right now? At the moment, I cannot see any slides from you. But if there is a problem, we can also share it from our side because we do have your slides on file. Yeah, one, one second. I'll try the final attempt if it doesn't work. Can you see the slides now again? Um, yes, but again, not in the presentation mode, only in a small screen. Yeah. It's still a small screen because then yes. let's switch to the, no, I, I'm on the big screen. So maybe we can use your slides then as the backup. Okay. Um, Maria, can you help us with that and share your screen? Hopefully that's working. You then need to stop sharing, um, Pablo, yeah. please. I'm stopping sharing right now. Yeah. Okay, now we can see the big screen from Maria Great. and the first slide. And I think you want to move already to the second slide. So thank you very yeah. much and apologies for the interruption. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for interrupting. Uh, next slide, please. So what we've created is a global online register for materials and products. Next slide. Yeah, next slide, please. Oh, that's a bit too fast. In the built environment, so real estate, and infrastructure. Next slide. And what we've done is we've created a cloud platform with four clear products. And if you use our platform, all these products that are mentioned are automatically calculated. So it's a platform where you upload your data in your dossier. And we prefer to do that, that you do that via IFC. So that's a BIM file, a building information model. And if you do not have that 3D a file available, you can also work with Excel. With that uh, information, we can we automatically create a passport. We can do that for the building, but we can also do it for material or for products that are applied or for a bridge or a road. We give a, a financial valuation of the material. So we give you the price of what's the raw material worth now and what do we think the value is in the future. And finally, we give a circularity index. So we calculate 
based on a couple of measures to what extent your object, so your building, um, uh, uh, is uh, capable for circularity. So uh, we look, for instance, at do you know what products and materials are applied? Did you use um, uh, bio-based products? And is the uh, uh, expected lifetime of the products that you apply, is that aligned with uh, the lifetime of the building? This circularity index is based upon the methodology of both cradle to cradle and the Ellen MacArthur methodology on what is circularity. Next slide, please. When we have this database and this data set um, uh, with, with, with all the built environment products and materials registered, you need a strong governance to make sure that the data is not abused and that we do not get platform accesses. Uh, making sure that your data stays your data and that we uh, act within the rules of privacy and security. So that is what we have established with the Medaster Foundation. Next slide, please. Next slide. Sorry, could you? Yeah, oh, that was a bit too fast again. But in combination with um, uh, public land registration uh, registrations, uh, most countries have such a register, we can create a data commons. So we combine the traditional data of buildings and infrastructural objects with circular data, and that creates a fantastic register that you can use to facilitate the circular economy. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please? Pablo, that yeah. can sometimes be a little bit of a, a technical ah. delay. Right. Um, that's that's why. Yeah, and sorry for the audience because I have a lot of slides. That's that's a lot of clicking as well. And maybe you can go through the uh, the next one. Um, because when we have a register, and yes, you can continue to the next, what then? Yeah, so thank you. Um, you can create a circular ecosystem that can rely on a trusted data source. So with this data in a register, with the proper governance, um, you can do all sorts of new applications that are valuable for the whole sector. And I want to give you a couple of examples of that. So next slide, please. So you can start managing smart cities. So if you have all the data of a particular region and you want to redevelop that region, you can combine information. And instead of um, uh, demolishing buildings and infrastructure, taking all the waste out of the area and then building new ones, you can reuse the materials that are already in a particular area available for redevelopment. Next slide, please. Also, you can automatically calculate the impact on the environment. For instance, what is the embodied carbon of the materials and the products that you have applied in your, uh, in your building? Next slide. And if you have the digital information of products and materials applied and they become uh, available because you don't need them anymore, for instance, after you get a new tenant in your building or when you do large maintenance activities or when you do some reconstruction or even demolishing, it's a lot easier to sell those materials and products based on the digital information than it is when you have the physical project, uh, uh, the physical um, uh, products available. So we facilitate trade using the digital twins of the materials and products applied. Next slide, please. And having information about the built environment, you can reduce risks, risks related to health and construction. And in the background um, of this picture, you can see Grandfell Tower, where there was a tragedy, uh, 72 people died because of the flammable cladding that was used. If we know where that cladding was used elsewhere, it becomes a lot easier to prevent risks and to prevent these strategies in the future by tracking and tracing them. 
Next slide, please. And that tracking and tracing can also be very uh, relevant for circular business models, because if you are a manufacturer and you want to know where your products are applied and you want to do, for instance, a refurbishment option or you want to do a buyback, you have to know where are the products applied. Obviously, as you can imagine, with our data governance structure, we want to avoid that everybody can read your data. So you always need to agree that your data is being used, uh, for instance, for manufacturers that want to give you a better offer. Next slide, please. Ready to go. Where are we and where are, um, um, what is our current installation base? Next slide, please. Um, we want to be where you are. So currently we are active in five countries. So the Netherlands, that's where we started, but we are rolling out in Germany, in Switzerland, Norway, um, Belgium, and we are in close contact with countries like Denmark, but also Poland, the UK. So, uh, and we have some registrations in Australia and in Taiwan. So we would like to be where you are. Um, if uh, obviously there is a request for a registration like this. So if you are interested, please reach out uh, so we can share more on what is it required to roll out to the platform to where you are active. Thank you, thank you very much for your time. Sorry a bit about the, uh, the, the presentation issue, but hopefully it was uh, possible to follow everything. Rev, back to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo, for this presentation. And I think uh, your presentation was then clearly visible on the screen. Uh, apologies again for the short technical difficulties. We now have about uh, almost 25 minutes for a panel discussion. And I would like to encourage everybody in the audience again to send in your questions through the chat function. The chat button is on the top right hand corner of your screen and please feel free to send in your question either in english or in russian we will have uh, we have the translation functions on site and i would like to invite all the speakers to switch on their camera for the panel discussion um, mariana and i will co-moderate this mariana if you allow me i will start with a very first question to uh, josefina lindblom from DG Environment at the European Commission. Um, Josefina, you talked about the introduction of levels and you talked about the whole life cycle approach the European is, Union is taking to reducing the lifetime climate impact of buildings. Can you tell us whether, from your perspective, there is a priority to reduce the operational emissions first or whether there is a priority to in, uh, reduce the embedded carbon emissions first or does it maybe go hand in hand what's the thinking of dg environment and the other dgs on that topic and before you answer i just would like to remind everybody to really switch off the microphone so that we avoid any background noise coming from the audience i think at the moment there is a little bit of background noise but i hope josefina we will be able to hear you well for your answer. Josefina, please. All right, thank you. Well, as you know, uh, uh, traditionally, uh, the focus has been indeed on the operational uh, energy, operational carbon, so the use phase. We have focused our policies on energy efficiency. But I really think that there is a, a growing, or I know that there is a, a really a growing uh, understanding of the importance of looking at the whole life cycle. And, and we know now that uh, buildings, uh, some very energy efficient buildings, uh, if, uh, if, they are, if they are made very energy efficient without considering uh, the whole life cycle, then you may end up with buildings which have so much sort of carbon emitted already before they have been started to use, uh, uh, to be used. Uh, because of all the carbon emissions related to the what the embodied carbon, right? So that it doesn't really make much sense. And of course, also, um, I wanted to point out that there is the time aspect as well, isn't there? That the embodied carbon, a large part of the, of the embodied carbon, uh, is emitted at the very beginning of a project, while the operational carbon, you still have hopefully some time to, <laughs> to work on during the use phase of the building. Regarding the policy itself, um, I see how this is gradually changing. I cannot say that it is now 
full focus on whole life carbon in all our different policies. We're not there yet, but we have certainly taken important steps. I mentioned some of them. And, and I think that this year we have seen, if I compare to where we were one year ago, when it comes to whole life carbon thinking in policy, we've taken a very big step this year. Um, and I can only assume also now knowing the, the understanding across the commission, uh, but this is this is really something that is going to to evolve further. So yeah, we we are on the right track. I think we still need to be pushed. You and others need to push us. Uh, but but we uh, our eyes are open for this now. Thank you, Josefina. And over to you, Mariana. Я бы хотела задать вопрос Ксении, даже. I would like to ask uh, Ksenia, actually I have, uh, uh, and I will begin with the more complicated. Uh... During the certification, you prepare um, reports um, in terms of um, cost of uh, environmental impact of uh, the building. So uh, how those, uh, those processes um, are impacting uh, the process of con construction? So. Um, is there any impact of those reports? Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for this very interesting question. So, um, our experience is the following. On the one hand, all developers want uh, to have the certification so that the building has a better characteristics in terms of marketing. Uh, yeah, so there is a clear motivation for the developers. Of course, um, in terms of level of awareness or, or in most of our cities, when it comes to assessment of the life cycle in terms of carbon footprint, um, work with the carbon footprint, uh, we have to say that um, there isn't much work being done and not much awareness as a whole. However, those uh, measures uh, used by developers already have a very good approach to buildings in terms of uh, their life cycle assessment. So, on average, if we were talking about best practices that are being implemented in Russia, so despite the fact that the developers are not maybe used, necessarily using a scientific approach, um, actually their final decisions that they're making um, end up uh, being very good ones in terms of uh, the life assessment of the building. I uh, was talking about certain examples in my presentation. There were examples of the works that we did for companies that build and then um, carry out the operation of the building in the future. So, um, so here we're talking about a whole different level of uh, life cycle assessment. But overall, I would say uh, there is a certain interest in terms of um, carbon footprint uh, assessment. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of, uh, there is awareness, there is some accountability now being done. So thank you for your question. But Senia, we always have a, a little bit of a delay because the translation is always a little bit late. So don't wonder, don't ask yourself why nothing is happening if the screen is a little bit frozen for five seconds. Mariana, I think that's normal with the delay in the translation. Um, I wanted to uh, ask Pablo uh, a quick question. Now, obviously, you have already quite a number of experience in building the Madasta database. Can you tell us um, how you're really populating, how you're really feeding, growing the database? Are these voluntary contributions uh, from companies? Do you make your own research? Do you work a lot together with um, research institutes who work on life cycle analysis? How do, you, how do you grow that database? And how do you then make sure that it's really responding 
to the needs of the construction industry? That's a fantastic question. Thank you for that. Um, first of all, uh, Madastar is not for free. So you have to pay for it to register because if a product is for free, you are the product. So what we say is you are not the product. We provide you the service to register. And in order to make sure that the registration is safe yeah, within privacy and security boundaries, you have to pay to register and store your data. So that's, that's for sure. So that means that the only uh, users we have are users that are truly want to make a difference and want to move towards circularity. So we work with the front runners in the market. So leading companies that say we want to invest in um, the knowledge and in the data and the awareness of what our buildings um, are and where they are constructed of or the infrastructure. So uh, it's like project developers or constructors that already chose to do a certification, for instance, DGMB or a, a BREEAM certification. Where, where the certification is a once-off activity. It gives you an indication of how good is it, where Madaster uh, provides, let's say, the library to make sure that the data that you've uh, assembled during such a certification process can be stored correctly and safely for a longer period of time. Um, and with that data, we can provide newer insights as well. For instance, if the um, European Commission comes with levels and you want to support levels, the data to do that is typically something that we have in, uh, in Madaster. So we work with the front runners in the market that want to benefit from this registration with their image, of course, eh? they want to do good, but also that they want to be prepared for the future because they believe that having insights on materials and products becomes much more important to be compliant with what our society or our, our, our economy needs. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's very clear. And uh, I would be interested to learn a little bit more about the details, how you can really uh, join and, and accept that commercial offer. But maybe we come to that later. Maybe um, we first look at whether we have uh, some questions, Mariana, in the chat. And I see a comment in Russian now. I speak no Russian whatsoever, so I don't know whether this is a question which you might want to address. Thank you. Yes, we have a question uh, to Ksenia in Russian. So what's the difference between Briam and Briam Rus? Uh, please, uh, please uh, switch uh, on the microphone. Uh, I'm so sorry, colleagues. Uh, uh, my microphone is uh, lighting blue, so I'm not sure whether it's on or on off. I'm sorry. So the difference is that BREM is a system of certification and BREM Rus is, uh, um, is a transition of standard, a translation of a standard, um, something like that. that, that that's a brief answer. So uh, there is no difference, just language. Well. Uh, BRIAM is a system of certification, uh, BRIAM International 2016. BRIAM RUS is a um, translation of a standard, so it's not a system. It's, uh, um, it's a book, let's say, a guide. So as far as I know, uh, when a building is uh, certified on BRIAM, then documents are accepted in Russian. And when POLIT is certified, then only in English. Yes, that's right. If building is certified, in the um, system of BRIAM, then the documents are accepted on using the local language uh, of the object, of the building object. So in, uh, in Russian, it's Russian, in Ukraine, it's Ukrainian, in Kazakhstan is the Kazakh language. Uh, great, um, thank you. Uh, Pablo says that Madaster is used during um, certification of BRIAM. Hey, um, have you ever used, have you ever used Madaster? No, unfortunately, we work with another program, but uh, we're very interested in your program, Pablo. Yes, me too. We, I, I would be very interested in uh, learning a little bit more about your program. Oliver, what do you think? Uh, perhaps our um, participants have questions to each other. 
<laughs> yes, I think actually we have uh, a colleague who will speak after the break, raising his hand, if I'm not mistaken. Vladimir Gumila will speak later in the second panel, but uh, Vladimir, I saw you raised your hand. Do you have a, a direct question to one of our panelists? Thank you. Please go ahead. Yes, yes, I have. I have a question uh, to Xenia and Josefina, and it's about how to reach out the majority of the uh, stakeholders, investors, uh, business sectors, users with uh, BRIAM, DGNB levels, lead, whatever, uh, system of building sustainability. Uh, because according to my uh, uh, knowledge, only important big investments are, are taking these steps because it's not so easy and it's not, uh, let's say, cheap to, to get assessed uh, against uh, this criteria. But there are majority of actors on the market which should base their activities on that principles in the whole life cycle of the building. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Um... Josefina, do you want to go first? Maybe quickly answer how to make yeah. sure that um, the approach is also interesting for smaller companies. Yeah. And then we uh, move to Xenia. But I actually want to ask uh, or to give Pablo an opportunity at the end to answer that question. So a question to all three of you. Josefina, please. Sure. No, it's a very good question. I, I want to stress that Levels is not a certification scheme, just to start with. Uh, there is no such thing as Levels Plus or Levels Gold or something like that. It is what we call a common language. So it's it's a methodology with 16 indicators, uh, which we have developed together and tested. And now we are using them to for three things, basically. We are using them to <clears throat> uh, implement this kind of thinking in, in policy. And of course, with policy, depending on the policy, it makes it either volun uh, voluntary or, or mandatory to, to apply, regardless of which project you are. Uh, and then we are also using them uh, to, uh, or certification schemes are, are starting to align themselves with, with levels. And then of course, just as you said, uh, it, it may still only target certain kinds of projects then. For example, uh, Xenia, I saw that you uh, had on your initial slide that you also work with DGNB. DGNB is one of those who are, are maybe in the forefront of aligning themselves with levels. So you may already have used levels indicators without knowing actually. Uh, and the third thing is that we have, of course, also made levels in such a way that we want it to be possible to use for any kind of building project. So it is not a certification. Uh, it is um, a, a tool where you choose the indicators that you're interested in. You choose the level in which you want to work with them on. You can pick up one or two indicators and use it use them at the first level, which typically consists of, of um, you say, check, uh, check boxes or, or lists with check boxes to ask you, have you considered this? Have you been looking into this? Uh, what are your, th you know, how have you taken these kinds of things into account? So it doesn't have to be a very big thing and very big investment from the beginning. You can really start gradually and sort of stepwise work your way up in your understanding and how you're using levels. So in that sense, Levels is, is a different animal to the certification schemes. Thank you. Xenia, do you have a perspective on what it would take to make sure that the well certification, the solutions to reduce whole life carbon are rolled out in a mainstream market? Or is that something um, which might still be quite a challenge in Russia at this point in time. Um, so if I understand the question correctly, the question is um, uh, whether the system is now uh, widely accepted on the market. Um, of course, there are the front runners that are using those new practices, a new system of certifications, uh, using um, participate in various ratings. Yes, this is a normal law of development of the market that uh, there are forerunners and there are people who are catching up. So at the moment, certification is not a mass uh, phenomenon. 
it's um, it's a niche um, uh, market for certain top projects and of course that is linked um, with uh, costs of certification as well because they, they are the costs of um, organizing so if we're talking about uh, smaller projects they um, they just cannot afford the certification but in terms of uh, the impact of certification uh, to uh, on smaller companies i think uh, there is still there is some awareness raising happening and i think that will uh, will have an impact on all the levels of market and all the projects in the long run thank you Um, Pablo, you mentioned earlier you're working with the front runners in the market. You said that very clearly. Um, but front runners, leaders, need someone who follows them. Um, what's your encouragement to those who are not in the front running group yet? Do you have a special offer maybe for them to, to make it easier to join the front runners group? Yeah. Um, well, the way how Madasta is set up is that the, uh, the costs for using Madaster are actually quite low, especially compared to uh, the high-end certification, um, which I fully imagine. If you if you are building a, a high riser in the city center uh, with 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 high uh, rates for uh, for rent, I can imagine that you want to show and indicate that you have the best the greenest or the, 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 the most interesting building. And then certification is definitely worthwhile. But for instance, for uh, residential real estate, you hardly see the, uh, the certifications uh, that they are active over there. Madaster supports um, certifications, but if you are not into certifying your objects, it doesn't matter. And as said, Madaster is actually quite uh, cheap compared to certification. Um, you you uh, the most important thing is that you pay for the basic calculations and the storage um, uh, of, of the object. So that means that per square meter per year, we're talking about cents, euro cents per year, and sometimes even, even less. So the larger uh, your portfolio is, the less you buy for using, uh, the less you pay for using Madaster. The way how we want to stimulate the use of Madaster is for uh, and i just give you the price because then it makes sense for 800 euros a year you can read uh, if uh, you can get a subscription for instance as a construction company or a development company or an architect and you can register whatever building you have so that's 800 euros a year um, if you are an asset owner you pay an amount per square meter and as said that is about cents per year depends a bit on the total size of your portfolio. So we stimulate via training uh, to try to include people in start using the tool. Um, uh, and also with offers, for instance, via the, um, uh, the country association of architects, construction companies, and try to make it easier for them. So that is how we try to push front runners. But my experience is that um, if the front runner says, yes, this is the good thing, the rest will follow easier. So it's always important to have those uh, front runners involved. Okay. Thank you very much. And I have one uh, question in the chat, uh, which I would like to direct uh, again to Xenia. Um, Xenia, you talked about um, the, well, the certification market in Russia. Do you see a big growth opportunity in uh, sustainable building certification? What are the most, uh, well, what are the biggest barriers? And um, is there something which could be, you know, copied maybe or learned from the EU's approach to certification? Your microphone is still off, or we don't have the Wait, translation please. yet. Uh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Uh, at this stage uh, of our market development, of uh, or maybe not market development, but our regulations development in terms of life cycle assessment, yes, um, we don't see any mass implementation. Uh, 
um, there is some growth, but in order to remove the barriers, um, I, I think the first barrier is the absence of um, economical uh, stimulation and leg legislative stimulation, stimulants. And the second barrier is the culture. So uh, I believe that when uh, the framework uh, moves, when the framework changes, we adapt our life, we adapt our culture. So uh, I believe that uh, the growth can be um, significant as long as there are stimulants from, uh, um, from the government side, from the community side. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, hopefully we can contribute with this webinar today also to some exchange, to some learning and to maybe overcoming some of the barriers and increase the collaboration between the European Union and Russia on this very important topic. Um, with that, I would like to close this first panel and just announce a very short break, uh, just for 10 minutes. We will continue with the second session at 30 minutes past the hour so please stay with us uh, don't leave us but uh, enjoy your 10 minute break maybe getting a coffee or another drink and we will continue at 30 minutes past the hour thank you thank you and i would like uh, to ask uh, all of our participants uh, uh, to stay online because uh, uh, you will get uh, uh, some, some questions uh, for uh, probably addressed to you. Uh, thank you.
Welcome back to the second session of this webinar on sustainable life cycle of buildings on a holistic approach, how to deliver sustainable buildings and reduce construction waste. And this webinar is organized by BPA in collaboration with ABOG, our partner in Russia. And the webinar is held in the context of the exchange between Russia and the European Union on policies to increase sustainability in the building sector, on policies to reduce the climate change impact of buildings and construction. And I would like to welcome you again all back to this second session. Just again, a quick reminder about your opportunities to engage with the panelists and the speakers in this webinar on your right hand top corner of your screen you should see a little button which says chat and if you click on that a chat box will open where you can send in your questions and comments in either russian or english don't worry about the language send them in the language you are more comfortable in we have online translation and there is also the opportunity to send in questions directly via the ABOC website, where this event is also being live streamed. So you do have a number of opportunities to engage with us. And there is, of course, also a simultaneous translation happening for all the presentations in the left top corner of your screen. You have a selection opportunity to select your audio channel. Either you select the floor, which means you will hear the presentation in the language in which it is given, either English or Russian. Or you then have a choice to select Russian or English. So please uh, select the right language for you so that you get the translation directly transmitted to your computer. So with that little technical introduction behind us, uh, Mariana, thank you for joining us again. I see you there on the screen. Wonderful. We will now start with the first presentation in the second session, which is going to focus on circular construction and strategies, good practice examples from Europe for these first two presentations. We will then go into the panel discussion where we'll also have participants from Russia. Now, our first speaker is Vladimir Gumila from the European Circular Construction Alliance. I'm very grateful that you're there this morning with us. Uh, you're holding a degree of Master of Science in Construction from the Ljubljana University and also an MBA from the University of Kansas. But we don't want to look so much at your academic track record. We rather want to uh, listen to your experiences with setting up the European Circular Construction Alliance and with the work this alliance is doing and is promoting circular construction to the many stakeholders across the European Union. Thank you very much for joining us. I will hand over the virtual microphone for the next 10 minutes to you. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you, you see my, my, uh, my slides, my screen. Yes, it is working fine. Ah, okay, perfect. Uh, so my name is Vladimir Gumilar, and uh, I'm a director of the Construction Cluster of Slovenia. This is legal organization since 2004. Uh, so this is my uh, legal responsibility. Uh, but also I'm uh, very active in different uh, uh, cluster based initiatives. And one of those was uh, the European Circular Construction Alliance partnership for internationalization so there we started with uh, circular construction and now we are initiated initiating the international one uh, and i will talk about uh, this international circular construction cluster initiative uh, in the next uh, minutes
Construction Cluster Slovenia is supporting business development, innovation transition to sustainable digital last year, also towards circle construction for some years uh, by different means and actions. Uh, so th this this is one of the uh, field of activities uh, I would like to present uh, to you. But let's start with the dream. And I, I just uh, 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 saw uh, uh, some statements, uh, some some information, or I don't know, some example how, how the dream can uh, go uh, uh, through. Uh, probably you all, you're familiar with, with uh, Martin Luther King and his speech on freedom of black people. Uh, it was it was happening one year before I was born. And this is still in progress, but the dreams are very important and we have to work on, on, on that. And uh, these readings I, I was uh, talking about is about uh, uh, sustainable abundance, what we are looking for. You know, we are just to focus on uh, abundance as such, having too much of many things, and this is not sustainable. So we have to be... Uh, uh, we have to have a good living, uh, but on sustainable way. And this also uh, relates to a uh, built environment, which enables our uh, work and our uh, uh, living conditions. Uh, so it's very important how we deal with, with that. And it has huge impact on the environment. I think you, you already heard today for, for figures, 30, 50% uh, of energy, so much uh, waste uh, is generated that we cannot uh, stay uh, um, away from that and uh, take it very seriously. And when I'm uh, trying to convince uh, listeners to, to what I'm talking about, I like to show this, this circle gap report uh, figure where the, the blue, blue, the blue big, big uh, fields are related to our, our sector. So a uh, huge amount of energy uh, and emissions, of course, and huge amount of uh, resources which can be, should be uh, used wisely. And uh, how, uh, I would like to talk about how to deal with that. Uh, it was presented in the previous session that there are activities ongoing uh, and there are more, uh, but uh, there is also a question how to get to the, the ground with that and how to actually bring all those uh, tools as Madaster and uh, systemic uh, support via levels to the majority of business. This is small and medium-sized enterprises which are running for the business more or less on daily basis and don't have uh, so much time for uh, uh, solving the, let's say, uh, uh, global issues, uh, if I'm uh, a little bit uh, direct. Uh, and it is not our own uh, problem, or Russian, or European one, or Slovenian one. It's a global one, and it relates to global uh, uh, sustainable uh, development uh, indicators. So we have to work together on that, uh, on global level. Uh, because any impact uh, to the environment uh, in in uh, uh, in one country where we take the the materials and and make some very green uh, products on the other uh, side of the world, uh, it's not green. It can be still uh, green a little bit, but it's more dark green than green uh, because we have to take into account the life cycle. And this, this life cycle and the, the supply chain goes along and along the planet. And uh, this is very important to, to, to be aware of. And Madaster and that kind of uh, life cycle uh, tools are very, very uh, useful, useful in the, this regard. Uh, and we here talk about the pro process. Uh, it's nice to have policies, green deal, uh, renovation wave, and so on and so forth. Uh, action plans and also regulation, uh, but then we have to have also the governance how to implement uh, that. And here uh, I think we need uh, many uh, organizations which are somehow of uh, accelerator or transition brokers in this in this in this domain, and uh, 
I, as cluster manager, of course, uh, see clusters as uh, these uh, transition brokers. Why? Because we have many of those clusters in the world, 3,000 plus in Europe, 7,000 around the globe. Uh, uh, more than 60 clusters uh, from Europe are in construction domain. Uh, more than 1,000 uh, of them are registered in European uh, cluster collaboration platform. So a huge pool of actors which are working hard uh, to support collaboration, innovation, internationalization, and uh, of course, nowadays global challenges, uh, circle economy, digitalization and resilience. And this is of course also stated by many means uh, by different policy actors, uh, politicians on European level. Uh, so we like uh, that uh, uh, statements, but we also uh, like or need uh, uh, support to do our, our, let's say, simply job. And what is important in, uh, in cluster that they're very dynamic. They evolve over time. They learn constantly from each other uh how to deal with with uh, these new challenges and this uh, should not uh, not be uh, forgotten uh and these changes are uh, uh, much more simple in this uh, flexible organization which are uh, financed in different way uh, and uh, led by uh, let's say uh, believers uh, of clusters uh, and also believers nowadays in circle transition, digitalization, and international uh, collaboration. Uh, why uh, they are so important? Because they connect the public uh, sector with their policies and support measures, uh, uh, academia with uh, uh, with results, results, outcomes of research to be uh, bring on the markets, uh, the financing. Uh, organization nowadays are also important to bring green financing uh, startups with new disruptive ideas and the main actors are SMEs scale-ups uh, actors uh, uh, actors in the market with with which are uh, the most uh, agile part of the economy so SMEs are the key key stakeholders of the of the clusters and uh, just today uh, ago there was uh, an event in paris i could not attend but it was you know uh, obvious what it was about about how to support uh, clusters in green and digital uh, transition and uh, we said uh, also uh, we initiated this international circle construction cluster to exploit these opportunities uh, the cluster can offer within the international collaboration. And this is uh, our international circle construction cluster in initiative about, about international collaboration for circle transition. Uh, because we know that we cannot do it alone, we, we, we must work uh, over the borders uh, around the globe and, and uh, the cluster can, can uh, can do that nowadays uh, uh, borderless, uh, and we learned all to do that in this COVID situation, where, where we communicate more or less uh, on uh, electronic uh, by electronic means. Um, the mission uh, defines the main field of activities, and it's about promotion of circle construction, uh, helping organization to to. Uh, empowering clusters to, to be able to support their organization in this transition, developing market, uh, promoting a tool as Madaster, uh, for example, uh, building new skills and jobs and, and profiles which are needed for this transition, and specific servi services and activities we can develop together according to our actual needs uh, on international scale. So this is, in short, uh, the, the ambition of, of this international cluster. And uh, currently, we have a uh, uh, quite strong uh, community of believers or followers or supporters uh, 
23 clusters and other organizations signed the support letter. Uh, the majority is still from EU, but also from Serbia, Mexico, Russian Federation. And I would like to, to thank uh, in this uh, uh, opportunity, Mr. Guy Ames from Russian Green Building Council and Dmitry Rezetsky and Rashid Nizamo from Kazan State University of Architecture and Engineering, which have uh, supported us in, in uh, these initiatives. And of course, you are all welcome to join and support uh, the initiative. Uh, the members are clusters, the core members are clustered, but any other organization can join if they share or if you share the same ambitions of international collaboration for circular transition. In incubation, we would like to set up this, this cluster as a cluster to be able to work together, find appropriate sources of financing uh, uh, and actually start uh, working. But it's not that we will start working. We already started uh, with uh, some activities. Uh, we organized quite some uh, webinars from different uh, in different parts uh, of the world uh, with with presenters, with speakers from different parts of the world, from Africa, India, Italy, and Germany, for example. Uh, and we are inviting you to join us and uh, organize with us a, a webinar. Uh, on a particular uh, topic, which can be interesting for global uh, uh, community. Uh, for more information, please follow us on LinkedIn. There are the majority information posted, uh, not on the web page. Uh, so uh, I think we have 240 followers already there. So uh, the messages uh, we post there are getting to the right uh, hands or ears. And uh, a minute uh, about our uh, project, uh, European one. Uh, this is another partnership for internationalization. It is targeting the uh, markets of Canada, uh, Mexico, Brazil, uh, Emirates, and India. And this is one of the four type of partnership for clusters for uh, for collaboration in different domains. And this is this is for internationalization. It's called IC Build. Uh, so that's what I was talking about. We look forward to support action, support measures of European Commission to uh, support uh, uh, our activities. In in this case, this is the internationalization of circle solutions to third markets. And we started with with, with this project uh, in September. So not uh, much to show right now but hopefully there will be results in in uh, next month so looking forward uh, to tell you more on the next uh, next event uh, thank you and that's yes. it for from my side thank you thank you very much vladimir gumila for this great overview and excellent to see that you already have the involvement of the russian green building council um the mr games will join us later in the panel discussion, which we will launch after this next presentation. And I'm now very happy to welcome our next speaker, Nora Sophie Griefan. She is the executive managing director and co founder of the NGO Cradle to Cradle. In fact, she already funded, uh, founded, I should say, founded this NGO and the Cradle to Cradle Lab during her studies. And she is one of the elected Green Biz 30 people under 30 back in 2018. Um, I'm very happy to have you here today and to learn more about the network you have launched, about the collaboration space to really promote cradle to cradle refurbishment. So I'm happy to hand over the virtual microphone for the next 10 minutes to you. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to see how I can um, actually share my presentation. I don't know if, if On the I'm allowed top, to. Yes, you are certainly allowed to, of course. On the top left uh, corner of your screen, there is a little button which says present. Yes, and if you I, click on that, you can then that. choose a window. Normally, there's oh, a pull-down menu which is opening, and you can 
choose the window which you want to share. Actually, this is not working. Um, it's just working to allow the sharing the presentation, but not to. Yeah, I cannot drop the presentation here. I don't know why. No, you just need to share the presentation. Then we should be able to see your screen. If you select the screen or the PowerPoint window. No, it's not working. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's not working. Good. Then um, we can try another alternative, uh, which would be that you very quickly email your presentation to my colleague, Maria, whose details you, I think you have. Um, she will then no. try to do her best to show the screen. And uh, if that doesn't work, we will have to live without slides. And you simply tell us what you want to tell us without the slides. Yes, of course, I would like to do this, but I may, you, maybe you can tell me the email address because I don't have it. Uh, hi, Nora. I actually sent it to Hello? you in a private chat just now. If you just check your private oh, chat. Okay. Yep. Great. It was. And maybe while we sort out the technicalities for the presentation, I just want to already give you a little bit of a sneak preview of the panel discussion, which we're going to have after this presentation. And again, I would like to encourage everybody to send in questions either through the chat function on this platform or through the engagement function on the ABOC platform. Mariana, I'm sure you are uh, monitoring that as well. And I hope that you get some interesting questions in. Mariana, can you confirm that? Da, da. Yes, there are interesting questions, but I would like to ask a question for Nora before we, the presentation starts. Um, it was very difficult to translate your presentation, Nora, into Russian. So, Nora, I would like um, yeah, to ask a question to you. So, it was very... Uh, difficult to translate it. It was um, about refurbishment from cradle to cradle. So what does that mean? We couldn't really translate it. What, what do you mean by cradle to cradle? I should just start. And uh, if this was the presentation is not working, I will just um, yeah talk to you without. That's also working without a problem. Um, I actually wanted to show you some pictures. So that's why I wanted to show you the presentation. But I think it's too big to just uh, send it that quick. And actually here they say I can also not upload upload the file. We also, so, sorry, we also have um, the PDF you sent us. Um, is, the, is maybe that worth sharing or is that going to make it a bit too complicated? Which PDF did I send to you? Uh, you sent us the PDF C2C NGO presentation. Is anything useful in there? Um, I am not sure if you got the right presentation. I'm sorry. I, I will just uh, start uh, without presentation. That's fine as well. OK, thank you very much. Then just please go ahead. And uh, I'm sure we will be able to cover the, the detailed questions also without the pictures. So please go ahead. Thank you. Yes. So by talking about cradle to cradle, um, actually, we talk about having a totally different design paradigm. Um, we are talking about that we can actually leave a big and positive footprint and actually stop only being less bad and trying to reduce our negative impact. So actually right now we are always working in a cradle to grave paradigm. So we're producing something and then we make something out of it. Um, and then we, at the end we have waste and we dump it. And actually, this is the old cradle to grave paradigm and the old economy. Now we say, OK, we need a, a true circular economy where actually all the materials go into cycles. But 
not a linear economy in cycles, but a, yeah, a, a circular economy that starts at the beginning. So to start at the beginning, you need to redesign everything you make. You need to start um, yeah, designing uh, at the beginning and actually designing for the usage scenario you're in. Um, so actually defining the quality um, we are working with and defining um, that we don't only want to be good in economy, good in social aspects, but when it comes to ecology, we are only trying to reduce our footprint and trying to um, reduce our negative impact. But why can't we maximize our positive impact and trying to really be good than only less bad? Um, this means that we need to have ambitions on not only to be more um, efficient and only to yeah, reduce the negative impact to only downcycle our materials because we start at the end, but actually really rethink our ambitions and um, reuse all the materials again and upcycling them. So that means at the end, we can have a more beneficial product um, in the next phase than we had in, uh, in the production phase. And that's um, the idea of being more effective than only being less um, efficient. So to go there, we need to think in two cycles, either in the, in the biologic, uh, biological cycle or in the technical cycle. So all products that are made for consumption need to go into the biosphere. And the biosphere means that they are produced consumed and then going into composting or becoming biological nutrients and then growing again. Um, if we go for products that are only used, then we can go um, into the technosphere. And that means that we are producing a product, we are using it and not consuming it. We're returning it, uh, then it can be disassembled. Um, they can be technical nutrients again and at the end, we can have a new preparation for a new product. Um, so for, for getting there, we need to actually design for innovation and we need to define our mat materials that they are not only free of toxic materials or what else, but actually defined as healthy uh, for the people and for the environment. Um, to get there, we need to find uh, figure out different business models. For example, we need to have service concepts. We need to actually close the loop by returning our products after use. We don't want to own them, but we need, to, yeah, we want to have the service of this product. So for example, having a washing machine, we don't want actually to have the metals of the washing machine, but we want to have clean clothes at home. And so we need to design for that. And then we can actually figure out scenarios where we only pay for, for example, 1000 times washing and not um, for the machine. Then our materials can become material banks. Our products can become material banks. And also the companies can become um, material banks. Um, for that, of course, we need to have digital passports for all those materials. We need to have digital metabolisms where we actually know where we have all our materials. And there are already uh, over 300 companies and over 8,000 products produced in a cradle to cradle way from yeah, a carpet to uh, um, clothes, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, shoes, you can also already find um, products like toilet paper, but of course also in the building sector. There are already examples in the building sector that a building can be like a tree and the city can be like a forest. So actually to produce a, a house that is not only made for having no rain and uh, no cold air around us, but actually to have have a beneficial footprint to the environment and to the 
yeah, the around us. So a building that is actually actually cleaning the air, that is um, having more energy than is it than it is using, that is a material bank. So that actually the materials are all, um, yeah, uh, digitalized, and we can actually take them apart really easily and then. Um, use them in a different way so the building becomes a material bank. Um, what we did as a Cradle to Cradle NGO, we are an, an NGO who is doing education, networking, transformation and of course these, um, yeah, this, this topic of Cradle to Cradle buildings, we have already a lot of best practices um, <clears throat> that we can see. For example, the City Hall in Fenlo in in the Netherlands, um, which is probably one of the best new buildings that is um, made uh, in a cradle to cradle way. Um, oh yeah, yeah, this is uh, nice to have some pictures of that, of course. Um, so here you can see some of the pictures and actually the this building is actually helping um, because the facade, facade is cleaning the air. Um, we have uh, purification of the water, natural light, and also the solar chimney provides natural air circulation in the building. So this building is actually um, yeah, one of the examples that you can see that is already um, yeah, uh, using this idea of cradle to cradle into new buildings. But now we are actually on a way that we have um, yeah, the, the problem that we need to um, uh, also work with all the buildings that are already there. And that's why we um, uh, did the project Cradle to Cradle Lab, where we actually um, renovated um, yeah, uh, an old building uh, from the East German time. Yeah, you can see here how it looked uh, before we did the reconstruction. Um, and so we took everything old outside uh, of this building and we uh, created a new space. And now you can see there the, um, yeah, the, the, new, the new, new looking uh, of this building. And actually uh, we created a space where we tried to use all the material that are already implemented uh, and that are already there in a cradle to cradle uh, way. And we uh, put put them in there and we uh, designed everything for actually taking it back out, out of there. And we showed that it's already possible from the carpet to the walls, to the electricity, um, to the furniture, that there is already possible to actually um, yeah, use cradle to cradle in um, buildings and also in the ones who are already there. And we think actually this is um, so important, but because uh, yeah, seventy percent of the buildings for twenty fifty are already there. So of course we need to work with them when we are talking about actually uh, becoming climate neutral or something. But actually this should not be the goal only becoming climate neutral but it should be the goal to actually have a positive impact. And this is where I would end for now with um, my short presentation. Um, and I'm happy to yeah, get to talk to you and your ideas because I think uh, we have a huge possibility here uh, when we are talking about the building sector and especially when we're talking about the building sector with the buildings who are already there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation and uh, I'm glad that we could show some of the pictures of the real projects uh, your organization has been supporting. We're now moving into the panel discussion and I will uh, give the floor to Mariana to start the moderation and to welcome the additional guests in, in addition to uh, the two speakers from whom we have just heard. So over to you Mariana. Прежде чем я перейду к дискуссии, я бы хотела сказать... Before I will uh, switch to the discussion, I would uh, like to ask Nori. Uh, so how uh, the way you take the old facility and uh, 
uh, modernize it. Actually, we do the same in Russia with uh, private uh, uh, persons when they build uh, flats, apartments, when they uh, rent uh, certain facilities for office work. We remove everything. We replace everything for modern, uh, nice looking, but all the garbage is not utilized, but just, uh, uh, just uh, delivered somewhere. So we no, do not use it. We do not use it, uh, reuse it. So that's how we uh, make uh, this new uh, refurbishing of the old buildings. Now I would like to get to our discussion. And I would like to uh, invite uh, our uh, participants. Maybe it's possible to just uh, give one hint to this as well, because I think, uh, of course, there's a huge um, amount of waste that is actually produced in this refurbishment, because a lot of these materials that are used in there are not made for actually recycling them. And they are, and that's a huge problem. But of course, now by actually refurbishing these uh, buildings we need to uh, focus on using materials that are really made for recycling them at the end and this is probably something that's a lot of times also not done because um there are yeah a lot of people are using maybe also not the the worst materials but then they are gluing them together and they are not actually um yeah digitalizing the building and so we don't know what kind of material is in there at the end and we don't know how to get it back and we don't know how to actually um, use materials that are uh, made for also for buildings and for people um, so this is something that is really important by looking at this refurbishments that we know what kind of material we are putting in there and that we actually also are not gluing everything together and just how that it looks somehow nice but actually Really, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we would prefer to uh, have a little longer conversation with you, but uh, unfortunately we are limited in time, so I invite our participants to be ready uh, to ask questions. And uh, for this uh, panel discussions, we have invited uh, two Russian specialists. Uh, Guy Ims, for example, uh, I know that he is here. And Yuri Hakanov, I'm not sure if he is here. Uh, Guy, uh, please uh, show yourself. Okay. All right, Guy, we can see you. We can see you. I'm with you, guys. Thank you. Yes, perfectly, perfectly. So first of all, I would like to introduce Guy. I, 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 I am acquainted with Guy for about uh, 20 years. He is, was born in England, but uh, his soul is Russian. And he, uh, as never as nobody else, uh, can really appreciate what uh, we have covered today to assess these European methods and how we can implement them in Russia. Uh, how many tools uh, we have uh, and uh, uh, which ones of them uh, can be utilized. Uh, uh, Guy uh, was born in Europe and uh, he lives in Russia for quite a long time. So Guy, please tell us what tools we have uh, been discussing uh, are actually uh, implementable in Russia and what we can do uh, that they could be implemented. Thank you, Mariana. It's an uh, excellent discussion today and uh, it's very, very, very positive. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, with many people, we are not acquainted, and I, we uh, believe that we will get acquainted. Uh, we have heard about European systems, about levels, and uh, uh, other tools. So, uh, certification systems uh, are very positive uh, tools, and of course, we have tasks. Uh, like cradle to cradle, uh, it's a, a certification system as well. And uh, we see that it's a long way. Uh, 13 years ago, we, we haven't had that. Uh, was no green building in this country. 
and we try to begin using uh, uh, international experience and uh, uh, many available tools which uh, were available at that point uh, to make uh, this construction industry more green. So how to use such systems? And uh, there is a motivation. So not only we get the better building, but we also can obtain the European certificate or international certificate uh, for, for a certain building. building. We also heard about uh, Modesta system from uh, Netherlands. The, the, this will, uh, I mean, this can be useful also for Russia, technical passport of the building. So, uh, but at the moment, well, it's a little bit futuristic because uh, for the moment, uh, in spite of the fact that this is logical to use, the, uh, to reuse uh, uh, the materials, not always possible uh, because uh, uh, there, is, there is no uh, sanitary certification or some other uh, documents in place because they are a, a mandatory for construction processes. But anyway, uh, these tools are very well. And uh, clusterization is a very positive uh, approach uh, because when all the participants of the market uh, unite and uh, begin building perfect buildings and uh, it's a synergy effect uh, and uh, our organization uh, of course uh, collaborate with such international organizations we we have uh, signed an agreement with the iccc and other uh, alliances with skolkovo innovative center in moscow and uh, so uh, uh, what else I would like to mention, it is very important uh, to uh, take care of the financing. So the financial model is very uh, crucial because uh, we need to move from traditional model to new model because now we have a very high interest to uh, green construction and uh, this year, I can see that uh, we are uh, really having a breakthrough and we uh, really need this European experience. So we uh, have close collaboration with our European colleagues and see um, what we can do about green financing uh, opportunities, not traditional mater non traditional materials and so on and so forth. So these three words, uh, uh, that's actually was I, what I was going to say. I see that there are other people uh, with uh, questions, uh, so I, I give them uh, such such an opportunity. Thank you, Guy. Uh, Guy is a prop, uh, propagandist uh, of the uh, green construction, and uh, he uh, actually moves across the country. He knows everyone who is involved with green uh, green construction, and uh, I will get back to you, Guy, with other questions. But maybe you can think about uh, uh, if you have. Uh, your own questions uh, for our speakers. Now I also got acquainted with uh, Yuri Hakanov. It's a uh, Skolkova Foundation. It's uh, it's like a, a golden medal, like kind of awards. <laughs> we expect a lot of innovations uh, from Skolkova Foundation. So Yuri is the uh, project director. It's a very uh, well experienced leader in management of uh, innovational ecosystems and so on and so forth. And he has uh, uh, some, I, I, I see PhD, but uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, probably in, in Russian classification, it is like candidate of science. Uh, Yuri, you have uh, listened to our European uh, colleagues' uh, uh, messages uh, regarding the organization. And as far as Skolkovo, is the most advanced uh, uh, forefront uh, of the industry. Maybe you have something to offer to our European colleagues and what you can uh, tell us about these innovations. Uh, yes, colleagues, thank you. Thank you so much for, for such uh, uh, well-packed with information. Uh, I mean, the dis this discussion uh, is very solid uh, content. It's really 
pleasant that we speak one language, you know, innovation language, technological language, and uh, all these uh, issues uh, which uh, had been articulated, we, we uh, always discuss. Uh, and uh, yesterday we had a big uh, uh, meeting about green concrete uh, technologies uh, and reusable concrete. Uh, so we also have a very, very interesting agenda. Of course, we have some uh, uh, delay in terms of time, so we are lagging behind our European colleagues in, uh, in a certain, uh, certain sense uh, regarding the implementation of these uh, solutions uh, uh, at uh, practical construction sites. But we are doing that practically. Uh, so uh, if uh, we uh, speak about Skolkovo, it was created as a platform so we have 450 hectares of land. So this platform was uh, created uh, for piloting and testing of uh, construction innovation uh, in particular. So first, uh, of, uh, first in Russia, it's, it was about seven years ago, pretty long uh, time ago. And uh, we uh, had the biggest uh, uh, block of uh, uh, smart houses. So now it's a standard, uh, even in Russia, many developers are building uh, living, uh, I mean, residential complexes like that. Two years ago, we began, uh, maybe two or three years ago, we started act actually uh, implementing uh, uh, unmanned uh, drones. Yes, and uh, uh, now it is implemented in many construction sites. And uh, first of all, uh, we also use uh, beam technologies, uh, uh, other digital approaches. Uh, and of course, when the whole uh, technological uh, range uh, is visible in, in the beam model, which actually embraces the whole cycle of work uh, from the uh, selecting the uh, area uh, uh, and uh, till operation phase. Of course, uh, uh, we ask uh, ourselves, uh, ourselves the question, what can we do? How can we uh, make sure this construction will be uh, environmentally uh, sound? And uh, I, I got uh, a lot of ideas, uh, and we will be implementing them as well. So, uh, as for international collaboration, Skolkal is an open platform, and uh, we are open to innovational solutions from any country of the world, and we will uh, be supporting it. Actually, I see Guy is nodding. Uh, so, these innovational uh, solutions uh, are uh, used in Skolkovo area. And we have such an approach, which is called soft lending. When uh, foreign startups, international startups, innovational solutions uh, can lend on our platform, Skolkovo platform, and start uh, their uh, works uh, related to implementation of certain uh, technologies and uh, solutions. Moreover, we are also uh, trying to uh, direct uh, all of our innovations uh, to international markets. And uh, for example, a few days ago in Dubai, we uh, had a uh, big international innovational summit where our startups uh, uh, participated very actively. And the two of the best which had been chosen were from Skolkovo residents. And one of them is, uh, uh, in particular, is a reuse of the materials. And here we are open for collaboration and uh, uh, at different levels. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your attention. Oliver, our time is up. 
do we continue our discussion or of this webinar, ah. uh, not on me closing the webinar, but I think on continuing the discussion. And if I may, I would I would actually have a, a quick discussion because uh, he mentioned or he described, uh, you know, the cradle to cradle challenge of this whole life cycle challenge almost as futuristic um, already at this point in, in time in, in Russia. And um, Yuri just said that some of the approaches are implemented. I wanted to make the link to what Nora Sophie said earlier. And I would like to ask you, what do you think, what kind of supportive framework needs to be there in order to support cradle to cradle construction, really? And, and then I would like to go back to our Russian panelists and, and ask them to, to respond to, to that idea uh, from Nora. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. There was also the question um, in the chat, uh, if cradle to cradle, um, that the costs of cradle to cradle are still high. And actually, um, I don't think so, that this is true. And I think that um, this is something that is a lot of times, um, yeah, is thought, but not 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 the case. Actually, for example, in, in, the, in the Netherlands, um, in this building, where they um, yeah did this uh, city hall, they were actually um, of yes they were investing uh, three million more than this building would have cost if they would have done it in a conventional way, but actually um, over the usage scenario of forty years they are saving uh, sixteen millions with this uh, building, and um, so they are already in a phase now this building is there and they are already now in a phase where uh, each year they are saving money and they are already um having their three million um investment already out again so actually um uh, that means when you're look by looking at a at a building of course you have to look at the lifetime of this building and of the the whole usage um, from this building. And actually, if you're not doing this, then it is more expensive. But if you're looking at the whole usage scenario, then it's always, most of the time, um, yeah, better to, to also more co uh, cost effective if you're producing it in a cradle to cradle way. And I think uh, this is something that would be needed to be implemented, not only in Russia, but in the most countries in a policy, uh, in policies that actually by looking at the um, at, at the buildings, we need, need to look at the true costs and also the costs that are um, produced during the lifetime of the building. And we need to actually also imp implement um, and actually integrate um, these costs by uh, yeah, in the building and by actually building this building. And then I think uh, there would be not only yeah, some vision or something, but this could be something that would make sense starting right now. Thank you. So this, this approach of total cost of ownership is very important. Uh, Guy, can you tell us whether this is uh, a, a topic which is uh, being considered in, in Russia as well, or does the typical real estate developer right now only look at the initial investment of capital which is needed? Um, Guy, please put the microphone on, please. Yes, uh, at the moment, I represent a community which works with um, developers. So I would like perhaps to take that question, if that's okay. So if that question was posed maybe a couple of years ago, I would say that developers are only thinking about costs, um, the costs of uh, constructing a building. But now the situation is rapidly changing. And right now, most of developers in Moscow, for example, 
are now talking about the whole uh, occupancy period. So uh, um, we're not, we're not, uh, perhaps uh, they're not considering the stage of demolition yet, but I think uh, that in the nearest future, these questions will be considered too. So as I said, we, um, we are lagging behind a little bit, but we're making progress. And the trends that are dis being discussed now, I think that in Russia, these trends will be discussed in maybe a year or two. So Guy, perhaps you could uh, add to that? Yes, several years ago, Uh, situation was different and the companies were prepared uh, to spend more money on a certification for example but now developers really understand the importance of those elements and a lot of developers are ready to um, to uh, take additional costs into consideration they understand at uh, the design stage, they understand the long-term impacts of those costs. So in terms of modern systems, I know that there are projects in Russia that are very interested in uh, using those modern systems. As Mariana said, I would like to enter the mass market where most of um, new builds would be built using eco-friendly principles. So, of course, one or two examples of that are good, but it's too slow because uh, climate change is accelerating and we have to take uh, measures very quickly. We see that we see in Europe, in the UK, we see the situations where um, all developers are obliged, are becoming obliged to use the new standards to comply with them. So there is also extra motivation of extra subsidies and financial help and funding. We know that uh, in Europe, um, the greenhouses, green bills started not because they are, if they're um, efficient in an economical way, but because it is uh, possible to do those green bills because there is some support. So th this is a very important element. Oliver, can I say a couple of words, please? I would like to say that Yuri and Guy are both right. I'm absolute, I absolutely agree with them. Guy said that each new build will be built uh, according to eco-friendly standards. But of course, we need to remember the old buildings as well, because they still consume a lot of energy. I would like to uh, show you an example of Russia uh, that can do everything when it's necessary. When we had a World Cup, of food of football here in Russia, there was a condition that the every stadium has to be certified according to green standards. And AVOC, us, we worked with um, FIFA, we developed a rating system of Russo um, football stadiums. We developed that system, we delivered it, we certified nine uh, stadiums out of 12. So what do we need? We need further legislation that would oblige everybody to um, do this certification. So this is an example of the fact that we are able to do everything, but we need legislation. We're awaiting it. Our president uh, said that we need to do decarbonization. However, he stressed the fact that we need to plant uh, forests, but somehow he didn't uh, touch upon the construction sector, unfortunately. But Guy and Yuri, we will, and me, we will be uh, working in that direction to persuade a president that we have not only plant forests, but also work with the construction sector. And before we end our seminar, 
I would like to uh, invite everybody um, to put their videos on to, so that we could um, uh, take a picture, a common picture. What do you think? Mariana, thanks a lot for the good invitation. I realize that we would have to discuss a lot more topics and these webinars are always way too short, but I actually think we have uh, created some opportunities to follow up in collaboration. I think um, the network which Vladimir Gumila presented is a really great opportunity to increase collaboration between the European Union and, and Russia. And also what Nora Sophie Griefan introduced with the cradle to cradle NGO and, and that concept. I think your approach also is to really create networks to increase exchange, increase and support learning. And so we shouldn't just see the limitations of these two and a half hours of a webinar, but we should rather see the opportunity for many, many follow up conversations, which we are hopefully going to have. And uh, Mariana, before I fully close the webinar, because we're at the final minute, I would like to give you an opportunity to also say some wrap up uh, words from your perspective. Um. Uh, personally, for me, all of these three webinars were very useful and interesting and i think that they will help me in um, my work as a vice pres president of avoc as a professor i also lead um, a department of uh, uh, regulatory developments so i started to um, to study uh, very interesting topics like recycling economy for example I hope that all participants of those webinars will not leave us, but will carry on sending uh, articles of, to publish in our, in our magazine. I hope that you will also participate in our conferences. We organize international conferences as well. I'm, I was very pleased to meet a lot of um, our participants for the first time. I'm also delighted to um, have met this uh, wonderful organization BPIE. I'm delighted to have met Oliver Rapp. I've used, I've learned a lot from you. We also have a conference ahead of us. So can you tell us please, what will be the difference between this upcoming conference and the webinars that we have already carried out? try to explain that difference now before I, I come to that I would like to thank again all the speakers and the panelists for their time today for their contributions it's great and I think this was the beginning of a longer a bigger exchange on the topic of sustainability whole life carbon in buildings closing the loop to really have a circular construction and making in general progress towards a more sustainable world and a strong collaboration between the European Union and Russia on these many important topics. Now, Mariana, you hinted already at it. This is not the final event. This is a third webinar. We will have a final conference, which is going to take place on the 20th of January. Again, it will be an online conference because um, yeah, the corona situation globally does not allow us to really travel and bring people together to the degree we would like to. But we will have a conference which will look forward how the collaboration can be increased, how to uh, decarbonize the building stock from the many perspectives we looked at in some more detail. And we will, of course, share the agenda ahead of time with you in early January. So this event will take place on the 20th of January. And I would like uh, again to thank the supporters, the funders of this series, the German Ministry for the Environment, uh, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety, and the European Commission for making this uh, exchange possible. And as I said already earlier, 
this webinar and the two ones before are available on the various pl platforms on our box website on bpae's website to listen in again and and to look at the many detailed contributions and with that i would like to close this webinar today mariana thanks again for the great collaboration in preparing it thank you to all the speakers i wish you all the best stay safe and healthy and i hope to see you all again in january at our final conference all the best and bye bye Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.